It's that time. On a Sunday afternoon, when we say, come, it's time for Musically Speaking. We had an interesting discussion early in this month on Dennis Brown, his life and times. One of the legends of not just Jamaican, but modern popular music. Now today, we're going to be dealing with a man whose accomplishments, it defies definition. It's just mind-boggling. Uh, you can't just think about a little guy coming from the hills of St. Anne and taking over the entire world. This is what his life is about. This is the life of Bob Marley. There is not a day since his passing that his name has not been called around the world. He was on this earth for a shorter period of time than he has been away from it. So think about that. It's 42 years that he has been away from here, roughly. And he only lived to be 36 years old. What an accomplishment in 36 years. It's mind-boggling when you think about it. And so we're talking about the man, the gong, Robert Nesta Mali, the man from St. Anne, arguably the most dominant music figure of the 20th century and perhaps of all times. Think about that coming from our shores. And so today we reflect on this remarkable life. And I have assembled a panel of people who know this man. They've been with him in different ways. Some as protégés, some as musical associates, some as, you know, so producers, so many different things, artistic director, so many different things. Online, we have a man who, his name is associated with Bob Marley's in a real way. Whenever you see the graphical depictions, that name springs to mind. We're talking about Neville Garrick. Hello, Neville. How are you, my brother? Greetings in the name of the Most High, His Imperial Majesty, Emperor Ed Selassie I, Jah Rastafari. Greetings, yes, greetings, my brother. Greetings. Talk about the skip. Yes, man. Yes, it is so beautiful to see you here, my brother. We also have someone who had the opportunity of being chosen by Bob Marley. You know, she was somebody who was signed to Tough Gong, you know, based on her prowess and her talent. Talking about my good friend, Jamaican star, child prodigy, talking about Nadine Sutherland. She's here with us today. Hi, how you doing? Big up, big up, big up. Mr. Garrick, Neville. Big up yourself, love you, man. My sister. <laughs> long, love time, you, long time, long time. It's been a long time. Mm -hmm. From the beginning. <laughs> From the beginning. <laughs> Sitting beside her is a man who knew Bob from the early days. Uh, and he's still associated with the, the Bob Marley Museum. You know, he, he's there all the time. Uh, he's very close to the family. Talking about Bongo Herman. Yes. Yes, Bongo. Greetings, Brother Neville. Love of Aya every time. A thousand years that side is like an evening gone. <laughs> True words. I respect you. Uh, and we're going to be joined shortly by a close friend, associate of Bob Marley, the legendary Jamaican footballer, Alan Skill Cole. And we'll also be joined later on by Sister Judy Mort, who was a member of that iconic 
backing trio, the I3. So it's going to be a real classic today because we're talking to people who know the skip, as Neville Garrick calls him. So, you know, Bob always said that he was going to be around for a while. He captured that in song. He told us he was prophetic. He said, them going tired for see my face. And what a prophecy that has been. You hear his name every day. You see his image every day. Somewhere around the world, there's a statue of him. Somewhere around the world, there's a play going on about him. Somewhere around the world, there's something going on with the name Bob Marley. And so I think... We need to start with that prophetic song, Bad Card, where he told us that I got tired for see my face. In a rubber dub style, the gong himself, the skip, as Neville Gary calls him, Robert Nesta Mali. Now, we're going to talk about the skip, not necessarily in a chronological order. We're just going to be freestyling and just getting people's impressions of this remarkable man and and and, and maybe um neville i want to start with you uh in the sense that you saw a lot of what unfolded on the road close up um you were also involved in the artistic direction side of what we saw tell us a little bit about that experience i want you, you you for example to tell me how you first encountered Mali? Wow. Well, <laughs> it goes back to working at the Daily News. And the Whalers were performing in front of Marvin Gaye at the Carrot Theater. And, that was uh, in 1975? Uh, no, no, 74. 74, okay. Yeah. I was the art director of the Jamaican Daily News. And... I wasn't pleased with what my photographers were bringing in. So I said, you know what? I have this concept of leadership by example. So let me go with you and I shoot as well. Well, at the Carib Theater, I was blown away because I'm just arriving basically from college in California after three and a half years where Marvin Gaye is God. And the whalers blew Marvin Gaye away. And I think at that exact moment, I said, you know what? This man is going somewhere, and I'm going to be a part of it. Well, that didn't really happen immediately. Uh, Gene Fairweather at the Daily News, our features editor, we decided to do a five-page piece on the whalers, Peter, Bob, and Bunny. And I visited Bunny in Bull Bay, saw Bob at Hope Road, and... Uh, that's the first time I ever really photographed him. I took some live shots at both the stadium and carried. But uh, these were my first kind of portrait shots. And I'm a person who don't shoot pose pictures. I like to just catch it candid. candid. And believe you me, those are the first and the best photographs I've ever made of Bob Marley. Because after I got to know him, I couldn't point a camera in his face too much. He'd probably say, well, you work for the CIA. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so I kind of lost that opportunity. So I did that, uh, went up, met him at Hope Road, and then I decided this is what I want to be. I'm a young Russ coming from school out of California. I have this art degree. I'm a visualizer. Instead of working for the Daily News or Carter Gamble Robinson, which I had an opportunity to work, I said, I'm going to put this towards Rastafari. So I resigned my job, went up to Hope Road. I was never on a salary or anything. I just created my own job to show Bob, well, from we doing things in-house, we have control of the graphics, and this is Rastafari I'm dealing with. So that's how that whole thing, that encounter, and how I eventually became a close friend of his. Bob might not consider me his best friend, but I consider him my best friend. Cause he's my second mentor in my life. Now, this was all after the separation with Bunny and Peter that you came into the into the picture. Am I correct? No, Neville? no, no. They weren't separated yet. 
In so, fact, I have a big relationship with Bunny and Peter, but most people ask me to talk about Bob. But I knew them uh, three individually and together, and I kind of feel like I'm the fourth musketeer, D'Artagnan. So, so, so your relationship with him started while the Whalers was still together. Now, the Whalers... Is yeah, that, remember they performed together at the show at, at, at the seventy four In the 74 show. Well, well, the 74 yeah, show. and that was the first time, incidentally, the I-Trees ever performed with them. Was at that show at the Carib and at uh, the National Stadium. So, uh, because Bunny left in 73 and um, Peter left in 74... Uh, so 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 that uh, you, you, you I mean the 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 argument about i threes would seem to to make sense there um for the, yeah, that yeah but they all performed together at the carriage okay. and at uh, Nash and you know our photographs that took right sure. right 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 yes and 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 then then that's where you got immersed now, what was the first project that you you, you you had with Bob that that was you said was of significance. Well, from some of the black and white pictures I took at the carry, I had them blown up into four posters, and I took them up to Hope Road and showed Bob and tell him you know, I want to sell these posters, and his answer was leave a hundred for the shop and go sell it. <laughs> so I think Tommy Cowan was who was distributing them for me at the time. So they were like at Aquarius and Talent Corporation. And a lot of people don't know that where they have the carnival festivals now, where one see Oxford Road, I think it was, that was a whole development of reggae and culture. Cause you know, Tommy was there, Muta Baruka used to come and sell him lunch, barefoot <laughs> with him, him sister. Uh, it's like, yeah man, that, the attic, he had the restaurant there, Ruth Sherman. I think Cindy used to work there as well. Uh, it was really like a cultural center. So it after a culture yard. Was about Peter. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was the original culture yard. And now it's something different, but that was like a meeting place. No, man, I remember Muta because he used to come in khaki clothes like in grade school. <laughs> <laughs> but short pants. <laughs> No, may have the history, you know. That's why I'm taking my shot. That's, 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 that's why we have to have you. That's that's why you have to be here, Neville. You yeah, have my short-term memory might be not so good. Maybe through my smoke away for her. But the long-term, the long-term on point. Oh, the long-term memory. It had point, it had point, it, it had point, it had point. <laughs> no, no, Nadine. Just, I mean, I mean, this, 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 this was a beautiful introduction from from, right. from Neville, and I want you to segue into your early experience with Bob Marley because you had your encounter with him after you won the Tasty's yeah, Talent Contest. Yeah. Tell us a little bit about that. So I, I remember the night when I won. Um, I find out um, that actually Sangi wanted. The That's second, Sangi place, Davis. Sangi the second Davis. place winner, which was Paul Blake, and it was Dan Jobson who said, I'm going with a little girl. So, so, so in other words, you didn't know beforehand that you were going to... I had no idea. I know I want Tasty, but I never knew. But it was Dan who advocated for me. And I remember it was in December when I won. And probably like a day after, two days, I went to Tough Gun. And I remember going into Tough Gun Gate and I went to the security guard and I was like, Daddy, come my father was with me. I will call with you know, they called Dan. Dan, Ronald, as usual, never will know Dan always a fix or locks them thick, you know. So Dan locks them always a follow to our our time and she has a flip it up back. So there she was and she go, Oh yeah, the little girl that want Tasty and then she said, um, I went in there and she took me around and she said, yeah, I forgot to meet Bob, man. Bob was on, he was, you know where the, the, the tree, close to the apartment complex, there was, a, there was an office there and Bob was there with him Jeep, leaning on him Jeep in, as usual, denim, like dark denim. And I went around there and she said, Bob, see the little girl there? And he just gleamed. I just, I'll never forget that. And 
my father al almost lost his head. Cause I remember them man that grew up with a rude boy with wheelers and then tran you know, translating to now Bob Rastafari. Right? So Bob, Bob Marley and the wheelers were their superstars, you know? But this would have been not too long before Bob transitioned, right? I never spent a lot of time with Bob. I, this was 1979, Bob transitioned in 1981. Right. So I would see Bob's, um, my first studio session, he was there. But my interaction with him was not a lot because he was always on tour. And then in my child's head, he was just missing. Mm -hmm. He was just missing. And I could not, you know, I don't know, tell picnic. Yeah, the things. explanation. There was right. no explanation. Right. There's no explanation how Bob just like, was just like missing. And then that's when, you know, like putting it together, that's when I realized that he was sick. Mm -hmm. So. Herman. I think we, we, we've been joined now by the legendary, legendary. Cherry, the, a legendary Alan Skill Cole, you know. He's, he's in, in the house now. <laughs> you talk about a legendary figure. That's him. I know, right? But, but Herman. Blessed, blessed. You knew Bob maybe a little earlier than, than maybe Nadine would. would. Um, you, you would have been there from the early days. Tell us a little bit about your experience there then. Listen, now Bob Marley to me is a prophet, a musical prophet. And when Bob leave St. Anne's, come to Trenchtown, I was living in Trenchtown at that time. And many people don't know that Bob could hold yarn and read yarn and tell you what, what happened to you. I heard about that side of him, you know. I think I yes. heard Alan say that, but I, no, I don't... No, it's really to check. I don't know. Just take it from Alan, tell you so, mm. and me tell you so, or something goes so. Bob was a musical prophet. He could have read yarn and tell you what I got him to. When Bob come to Trenchtown, he buck up on a man by the name of Tata, Martin McPlana, Joe Higgs. I'm at a fact, I saw the name Wheelers come for Joe Higgs. He them a sing and say, and wheeling sound. And him say, you better not call yourself the wheeling wheelers. Joe X pass off me, I'm so rest in peace right now. You know what I mean? But Bob was really a loving person to I. Um, you know, before Steve Bond, Ziggy Bond, and all of them Bond. I was one of them at Greenwich Park Road, and Bob leave from down. We him leave and come through Greenwich Park Road to go to Coxon. I was one of them and Leroy Sibyls and Hep Tones could go on the fence and call Sister Rita Marley for him. But the lady who goes Sister Rita Marley was so strict. Her name was Miss Britton. Auntie. Auntie. It was Auntie. Mm -hmm. yeah, so, so strict. So we'd have to go and call Sister Rita for Bob and to come at the fence side and come do them little whispering. Yes, and let them leave and go in a shoe and come back around. So you you knew Bob before he started recording or Yeah or, man. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So we're joined now by Alan <laughs> a man whose name is so associated with that of Bob Marley's. Um Alan, it seems Bob had a fascination for football. And that that in itself was a great attraction for him to, towards you. Is that is that a correct assessment? Well, I can agree with that to an extent, but not fully. All right, <laughs> tell me why you disagree. Not that, not that I disagree, but um, he was a love of the game. Mm -hmm. Was he a good Passed player? It? In the, uh, in the talent? Well, um, <laughs> Bob was a hard worker. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, you know, he wanted to, to be to be able to master the ball because he was with me and, um, as I said, he had a passion for the game. But there was this thing about him that anything that he saw, we did. It was like a trick, something like that. He want to try them too? <clears throat> and he will go there for hours in the sun and he practice it until he get it together. So but going back to if he was a good footballer, as, as I always tell him, I say, you come a little bit too late. <coughs> in terms of, you see, 
um, like like in every um, what you call it, profession, mm -hmm. you find that there are certain things that you have to master from a tender age before you get what you call it, you go on the wrong track, you get spoiled. Mm -hmm. So I used to tell them all the way, I'd say, you know, um, you come a little bit too late because um, the habits, like, it was a bit flat-footed and there were <coughs> some uh, technical, anyhow, we work on those things, but he became better and better and better, you know, in terms of he would play and he would watch and he, as I said, he was a, he was a, he was a, he was a quick learner and he had, because he wanted was to play the game, he put so much in that, he, he saw he was improving, he was getting there. And there was a house of dread. Yeah, even before that, but, you know, like for instance, no, I used to tell him that to, to be able to be a good footballer, you have to be able to master, control the ball at any given time. So one of the, the thing about that, he would kick the ball every day, and the sun, even in the other time, we go in the sun and he's juggling and juggling and juggling and juggling. And um, till he got it. So when we went on tour now, as we, got, as we reach, reach in the suite, me and him, I want to juggle, and I make him know, say, look here. If you can't juggle inside here and don't break nothing, then you get to the stage and become <laughs> a ninja. <laughs> you love that because, you know, we had, in, in this suite, we, had, so we, we didn't have much area. And so, so it, it, would, it would be, and it started to master it. So what happened now is that we are friends away in a place called Windsor Hotel one time. In the early days, before, that was about 1970, about 70, 71, that we were in the Windsor, I'll never forget. And the water coming inside, we had the ball, and I said, if you broke anything inside this place, you know, you're going to have a problem, you have to pay for it, you know, you're going to lose the stripes, you know. So come on, come on. Anyhow, we started juggling. Made a mistake, and um, one of the, the ball, you know, the, the shades, yeah. got, got touched. <laughs> and the man started it on the place, I said, you know, it cost, I don't forget, it cost, that shit cost almost 200 years at that yes. time. And he said, Yeah. But we went after that and we went to all, we went to Europe as we were going out and we started. And he mastered it. Yes. So, it's, as I said, it's, during this, the, the, the process of time, his game improved. Yes. Yeah. All right. We're going to take a break. Uh, <laughs> what a conversation. Uh, Neville Garrick, <laughs> Alan Cole, Nadine Sutherland. Bonger Herman, and, and we're going to be joined by, by Judy Mott later on. Uh, what a show, musically speaking, examining the life and the times of Robert Nesta Motley. Early days of Bob Marley, the earliest recording of Bob Marley, you know, this was done at Leslie Kong's Beverly Studio. And you know who was in that session? Uh, Jimmy Cliff, yeah? And the great Derek Morgan, they were there in, in, in that session. Um, Leslie Kong was a legendary producer at the time. Alan, you 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 have any background story on what happened there? You know what what might have happened there? Uh, well, I can't remember what, oh, um, Bob. I can't give you like how he gave it to me. Yes. So he went for to an audition at um, at Beverly's. Mm -hmm. um, the people who were doing the audition for Leslie Kong were. There's Derek Morgan and, and Jimmy. Unfortunately, when he went there at that time, Derek Morgan probably went somewhere. So he ended up uh, meeting Jimmy. And Jimmy was the one who did the audition with Bob. <coughs> because Bob, sta Bob said he went inside there and Jimmy was doing, was um, work, working on a, a tr one, probably one of his trucks. And Bob said, Jimmy said, Jimmy, tell me that. Bob said to him, well, that sounds good, man. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's what Jimmy told me years ago. So I'm um, anyhow. So that's how it started. Yeah, and it's important that also Jimmy preceded Bob at Island Records too, because he had a, he had a, he had a, he had a career going on there with Blackwell <laughs> before yeah. before Marley did. You know, Th these these are interesting pieces of of information. Uh, well, Jimmy Cliff was the was the man in in. in um, the the man was carrying the the torch right in in, in 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 remember Jimmy became very popular in England and he heard before every other um, Jamaican artist 
He was Ireland top, 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 top. No, he top, was, he was, he was big. He was, he was, he was a big star for Ireland. Yeah, not only for Ireland, but he was, a, he was, he was big in Europe. Yes. No, yeah. no, no. I want because people and you, 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 you refer to it, Alan, um, about Bob's persistence and his dedication. Um, people always talk about how meticulous he was. Uh, Neville, um, tell us how you saw that i mean was he somebody who micromanaged things was he somebody who was always going into very detailed analysis of maybe the artwork and making recommendations or suggestions or you just leave people to do what they were doing what what was it like well my experience with him was basically left it up to me there's only one time or two times there was ever a rejection in terms of album covers, we'd come up with the concept of a title. And I know that one word title is the greatest way to move any product. Survival, Kaya, <laughs> Exodus, Uprising, in terms of the marketing skills I had learned from school. Now, Bob was meticulous in the way that he was a very hard taskmaster. Don't mess up his music. He would fight you over that, see? Bob is a man that after the shows, he would listen to the show on the bus and listen for mistake. Whether the audience was rah rah or anything, if him hear mistake, he talk about it and say, then I'm a, a musician. I said, but the crowd did love it and say, yeah, but there are musicians in the crowd and then hear the mistake. He was the first man to be on the bus. He was like a superstar thing. And he watch who come late. So, you know, in terms of the music and how I approach everything, it, it was like perfectionist. And that grew inside of me of trying to be the perfect person that can bring out that perfection out of me. It was a man also that you couldn't tell him no or can't. That is not in my vocabulary. So there's a man when him asked me for something or something come up, I just had to find a way. I couldn't come say, skip well, boy, I can't do this. That's a bad I know, but still, he's a very loving and compassionate person. And I guess you did really check for me and expect the most from me. So I tried my best. So that is kind of the things in mentorship me with. Um, Herman, yeah. I, I want you to give me maybe one of your most memorable encounters with, with, with Bob something that has lived with you um, through the years. I mean, from the very time you knew him until, you know, he transitioned. Can you, can you give me an example of any of those experiences? First of all, this is one. Mm, well, I mean, most of the people are hearing. Some, some are seeing, but a lot of them are hearing. Yeah, look, you can look. Yes. 56 Hope Road. Mm -hmm. We never play a ball. A skill I tell you about him on the ball thing. The man carry mm -hmm. the ball in my face and take it back out and bust out a laugh. But I tried to take the ball from him and I couldn't take it. And mm -hmm. the next thing again, you have some set of guys in the yard. When they have a mock on the almond tree there. And what really happened is that when the ball go in there, they don't have any shoes. And they run go in the mock and pick up the ball and carry it back come to the gang. <laughs> that's how them love God. <laughs> yes, that's how them love it. I don't know what they had at the day when they left out there. Everybody have a whole something. They have a whole something. <laughs> you see? My papa was really a loving person. A kind hearted. Sometimes I wonder if I brought some news and I was half him out. <laughs> you him, you, you him kind and loving. You know what I mean? Yeah. I can remember when Jacob Miller, Jacob Miller, me and him and sister Diane up at the yard. We just left out a GP prison and go to a concert and Jacob Miller. I will come up at the yard. Eh? So while we're in the yard now, Jacob decides him want to have a And he drive out, go down half a tree. Then we hear say Jacob crash. We run out of the yard now and go down to go see the car bend up near the light post. Jacob gone. And it's me, Bob, saying God the funeral and give him money and say, take a taxi and go represent him. 
Yeah. So the 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 the, the stories um, are legendary. Let you know, and I, I want to to talk with. This with, is hold with, on, look one minute, sir. This is the father and the mother and gang when they be home. <laughs> All right, yes, younger. And, and, and this I would want to put to, to, to both Alan and to Neville. Uh, the, the question, and, and Nadine, I mean, from her childhood perspective, she would basically have some inclination as to what he was, was like in terms of a businessman. Um, how did you see Bob as a businessman, um, Alan? Was he a good businessman? When you say a good, yeah, be careful now. <laughs> because um, you talk to somebody who, um, <coughs> I don't know qualms. <laughs> if he was a good businessman, no. He wasn't a good businessman? No. no. Okay. No, so, and, 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 um, you don't think he but was... But he had the inclination. He had the inclination yeah. to be a good businessman. Yes. But you didn't think he was a good businessman. No. Okay. Pers when, he, when he tries to do it by himself, mm -hmm. I don't think... Um, I won't... I won't... I won't be one of those who say, tell you, yes, he was a good business. People get carried away and... Right. And I know people are... And they, people just... They don't like to be truthful. Right. But I'm a person that I'm truthful. Yes. So if you want to vex, you vex. Yes. And it's simple. You ask me a question. Right. And I'm telling you exactly. And I don't think anybody knows more than me. Okay. <laughs> Honestly. Uh, no, no, uh, no. And, and, and this, because the, the, the point is, a lot of people say that Bob was not obsessed with money. Money was secondary to him. Um, in the sense that he would say, if money will come, money will come. In other words, he was more interested in his craft, and what happened afterwards is just the byproduct of somebody who excelled and is and reaped the benefit, even if his his his, his, his um his um hears they reap the benefit of that um kind of commitment to excellence, and that he himself was not really driven by money and and material things. You want me to, yeah, 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 you you want me to be yeah okay. and then I'll talk to Neville and so, go around. So, from what I <coughs> am understanding is that you're saying to me that um, he didn't care for material things. No, I, I'm saying I don't think he was a materialist, and this is speaking. Yes. I don't think he was a materialist. Okay. Um, if he cared for money... I think he cared for his money. Mm -hmm. But he didn't put all that emphasis. Right. Like money was the number one criteria. Right. You know, so he would just play it the way, as he always said, um, he would wait on time. He would wait on time. So he played the event accordingly. Because he always said, boy, it's going to work out. You know? He always said, boy, it's going to work out. You know? So he's a man who had, um, he had vision. Mm -hmm. And he believed that time would always work out things for him. That's his, his, his concept. Uh, and before so many, so many different occasions, okay, so many different things that we went through that, and I realized that what he, what he, was, what he was all about. Before I go to Neville with the, with this, with, with, with the first question that I ask you, uh, you think that he would have envisioned the kind of impact that he has had on the world today? You think in his wildest dreams? All right, let me tell you this. I remember the last time I, before I left him when I was, I was leaving him. Leaving him where, in Germany? In Germany, yeah. Yes, right uh, with now. Dr. Issels. Yeah, we were about to transfer to get back to Miami. Mm -hmm. So we both were, we were talking. He was laying down in the back and I was talking to him. And I said to him, well... He sure will be kind to you, my friend, don't worry. Mm. That's the last time I saw him smile. He was very, he was down, and I was saying, but he's going to be kind to you, don't worry. Because I said to him, I think, I said, um, one thing I said to him, I said, when you balance everything, 
how the scale up to you? And he was like, I said, you don't want good and bad? You're safe. Mm. You know? So, um, if he would have expected this, I don't think so. But you must understand what, there's a lot of things that took place after my pass. Mm -hmm. And um, that's another story. Right. Yeah. Um, ne Neville, I'm going to put the same question to you. Um, if you thought he was a great businessman, I mean, given all the success that you, you know you see um, happening, was he a great businessman? Um, did you think he had an instinctive sense of what was right and wrong in terms of business, or he was just somebody who wasn't was um, just wasn't too caught up with with, with, with yes um, wasn't too caught up with the financial side of things Material side. Um, I don't know I, I, I is never uh, um, okay all right yes yeah, so so Alan what you were you you, you were saying that um, to you the the, the, the the how it appeared was that the financial and material seem to have been secondary um, in, in his scheme of things. But, of course, he, he understood the importance of money and all of that. Nadine, what, what, what from your childhood perspective, or, or just in terms of retrospective um, thinking, what would you say about what you gathered about him from your experience as a youngster with him? Um, I stepped in as a country girl, so when I was at um, Tough Gong, I was in awe. So, you know, to see the building, to see that he had a store, merchandising and all of that, you know, in my little head, I just thought he was just like supreme businessman. But I want to go to um, him as a musician and what um, never remarked about him having just like, just wanting his craft to be perfect. I experienced that secondhand. Because when the first tour that I did with the Marleys, which was Hay World Tour with his children mm. and with Mrs. Rita Marley, and with the I3, all of that foundation that they want to rehearse every day and make sure the show is on point and make sure everything is good, you hear that it come from being under Bob tutelage. That Bob was a perfectionist. So you see it carries through in how his children perform, in how the I3 perform, and I benefited from that kind of mentality. Because I don't, I can't go on stage unless I'm rehearsed, you know, it's like some of the stuff right now, I can't relate to it because I come from that school. The Bob Marley school, I am from that school and I'm very proud in terms of his wanting his music to be at a certain level or you would be displeased. And I heard that through the grapevine as I grew up there so for him it was not just about talent and and skill talked about that in terms of how he approached football yeah it and that tight, seemed to that seemed to have been tight. reflected in all that aspects seemed to be of like, his life that's who he is yeah. that's who he was when it comes to you know the quality of what he wanted he wanted excellence so you see as I never said and everybody come to the country you, i knew that like he's a perfectionist and um you know we spend it's hours and hours. Bob, myself, and family, man, we spent mixing, mixing, making stampers, destroying stampers when you play, play the test press. That's, the mix was a little bit out. You have to go back in the studio until like that, till he got what he wanted. You understand what I'm saying? He was so disciplined. In rehearsal, if you watch him, going to dress rehearsal, going to, to, to the gigs, he was so focused that nothing could come inside of his, in that, um, in that space. In that space. He was focused. We have so, to see. So people, were, people who work with him understood that. When you come out and show, be, we come on the show time, working time, don't mess around. Can I say something with all of that? We understand why his music transcend time, because of the quality. Even though he put on a Bob Marley, album, the mix, the musicianship, his voice. You can see 
why it transcend time because the quality was excellent the quality was and still is excellent you know and you know we that's a lesson for those who are coming and listening and you know we should everybody we out there listening people out there listening we don't understand who you know, was not all that close to understand what was happening the family man family man that was the man mm. who did all the mixing. There were times when Bob would drop asleep and we would drop asleep and family and mixing for hours, three, four o'clock in the morning, we family was there. Family man did all the work. I mean, I said most of that work. Mm. He was the 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 that ear mm. that um, Bob always listened to. Relied on to yeah, and depended yeah, on and yeah. trusted. He just really he, didn't, you know, he hasn't gotten much credit, and the world should know about that. Family man was, was a major man here. Mm -hmm. And when Daddy says music transfer, you see, music is, music is such a funny, such a funny, um, what do you call it now? It's such a funny thing, I don't think that's the right thing, but um, <coughs> as I always, used, I used to tell him that it's not your music that's going to make you powerful. Is your content, your lyrics, the message that was his, <coughs> that was um, Marley's, um, that was where you got all that energy from. There Why is music chant? You will hear, you can't, you will hear his music for generations. Yeah. You, 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 you. Um, I've always noted this. You would hear of many of the other noted Jamaican acts not turning up for shows. They're paid for events and they don't turn up. But I have tried and I've researched and I've tried to find out if there was ever an instant where Bob was paid for a show and he never turned up. I wonder and if this is true, Anna, but listen, I always there's something that if it's one person turn up for a show, he's going to play. Listen, is that true? Listen, Bob and I was together. I was manager of the year. You probably don't know that. But when we made bookings for show, and you had rehearsal time, listen, man, don't mess around. Pete and Bunny, on spot, on time. Professional. They don't mess around. We get, when they call it, your people are born, you get to advance, and everybody happy. Those guys are professional. Time, rehearsal, 3.30, they're going to be there by 3 o'clock. I'm telling you, mm. short eight o'clock, we're going to be there by seven o'clock. No, there's no if and but about that. I can't tell you. But was that was that the Whalers or was that Bob Marley? Because what would happen is that subsequently you'd hear of incidents in which um, yeah. Peter no, or, or, or 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 or, 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 or Bonnie would not turn up. Foolishness, foolishness. No, but you, you, you said it didn't happen. <clears throat> Not, not under my management. No, not no, not talking under your management. I'm saying we're talking whalers separate Bob Marley and the whalers separate from when these people had individual careers. Yeah. And when Bob 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 never seemed to I mean, people will say, Well, Bunny don't turn up for your show on him yet. But you never hear of us incident in which Bob No, no. Bob is not that type of person. Not that type of person. From And, and that's interesting. He's not that type of person. Bob is not that type of person. He was he was serious about his trade. He wanted he kept his name yes. on top because he didn't mess around. Don't be about ten or forty. He didn't mess around. And I tell you something. When you're talking about the whalers now, when you have when you used to have show like Peter used to live in um in that period, Peter used to live like when Peter, Peter moved, he used to live in Waterhouse one time. Bonnie would live out at um, Coleville, uh -huh. and Bob would be in Trenchtown, about um, Greenwich Park Road. And we have, we have a show like, say, Friday night we have a show. Short time, it was supposed to be 9 o'clock. By 7 o'clock, I would pick up Bonnie and Peter, First Street, or Second, First Street mostly, and then we go and pick up Bob at Greenwich Park Road. And we're going straight to the venue. Mm -hmm. Hour before show, and you see in a corner until this time before you know they get going. So, the, I, uh, I, we well, didn't have that problem. I didn't, we didn't have that problem. Yeah, I wonder if you could have just remember Mr. Clive about JBC 
when the song them not playing well and you go down there and nobody can come out of the radio station. <laughs> <laughs> well, Alan, why, Alan, why are you looking at me like that? <laughs> I don't know where, where Herman, wait, wait, wait. You, you say something, you say something that's skill. Stir, stir up some. Yeah, if I stir up something. Stir, yeah, if I throw it in a fire. If I throw, no, no. Yeah. <laughs> 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 those, those, are, those are history. Those are days that uh, we have to do what we have to do. You have to do what you have to do. Yeah. Um, and that meant that you were not securing airplay. And as a result, no, I was securing airplay. Oh, you were securing airplay, yeah, or what you were doing was to secure airplay. Yeah, yeah. You <laughs> oh, see, I see what you mean. The music, yeah, I don't think you, you don't understand where the music is. <laughs> <laughs> um, music business in Jamaica was a, a clannish type of mm. business where certain people control the business, mm. if you want to put it there, <clears> certain <throat> companies, mm. they had all the if the, the artist didn't go through them, God bless them suffer. So, um, yeah, <laughs> when we became an independent um, entity, we just uh, we want a piece of the cake. Mm -hmm. You have to get a piece of the cake. Let's take a break. <laughs> as, as, as Kill talks about his piece of the cake, musically speaking, that's the program. Member of the I3, Judy Mort. Yes, she is going to give her impressions of working with Bob Marley. Uh, this has been a real inspiring program. You know, people so close to to Bob Marley. We 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 had uh, Neville. Neville was online, and I was asking him a question. But then, um, Neville, did you did you did you hear my question? No, I didn't hear a question. No, I, I was I asking. I was asking the question about um, Bob Marley as a businessman and what you thought about him as a businessman. Well, Bob kind of eventually learned by trial and error. As Skill Cole say, he was no great businessman. I never really had that training. So, but he's still a man who really loyal to me and a lot to him. So he would be checking on things and make sure so everything right. But I couldn't say he was a, he was a businessman in the sense where he wanted to have his own entity. So after he came back from for the peace concert and decided to build a recording pressing plant, a record shop, a studio, so everything would be in-house, Tough Gang International. He was upset with me because I never other printing press so him could have print him him label and everything right there so in terms of business and looking forward that i would say yeah it was yeah oh. yes um we seem we seem to have a, a challenge there um but what neville is saying seems to underscore what what alan has been saying we're, we're going to we're going to bring in uh, Sister Judy shortly uh, to really give us her impression of, of of Bob Marley. She'll be joining the panel here. Uh, Nadine, you have you had a a, a, a a Bob Marley selection that is close to your heart. What which 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 one is that? The one the first one is Smile. That when I was a little girl and I used to hear that, my my heart would smile. I actually would smile. You're in Jamaica, y'all. Oh, and that, 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 there's a whole story around that song. You serious? No, I mean, the, well, the, 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 the concert and all of that. Oh, Smile Jamaica concert. Yes, mm. yes, yes. So that's a big one. Uh, let's hear it, Kevin. In Jamaica, Smile Jamaica, Bob Marley, joined by one of the members of the I3. Yes, we're talking, we're talking big time here. We're talking Judy Mort. She's in the house. Queen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, and I, I'm just going to go straight into it. Um, Judy, you were an integral part of that whole show that Bob Marley presented to the world. Mm -hmm. uh, that must have been quite an experience, uh, working with him and being a part of something that was so important musically. On reflection, what, what, how you see that whole 
scenario with, with, with him and how it has turned out? Well, I personally, I don't even think that Bob knew that it was going to turn out so big because it was huge. When we started, we started at a little club in Boston, Paul's Mall. Yeah, Paul's Mall. Paul's Mall. That was what, 74? That was about 74. Yes. And uh, what we realized, the house was so small that it held about 500 people. And then they had to turn the house from seven to about nine, and Bob would perform, and then after that, then they would have the other concert. So you'd have a number of shows on a particular day? R no. Each day it would be two shows. Okay. Yeah. But then when you look at that, 500 people, and then the next year when you go on the road, is like 2,000. 2,000. And it grew and grew and grew to um, 1980 when we went on tour in Europe. That was 180, 80,000 people, 100,000 people. That was phenomenal. When you started, did you have any idea or inclination that it would have been so massive? That's what I said. Nobody knew. I didn't know that. I didn't know, but you know, the father who sent him there prepared the people because he knew what the, 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 the ministry, when I say ministry, the work that he gave Bob. And the, but God wanted the people to know, to hear the message. And so, I mean, so many people came out, 80,000, 70,000, 60,000. I mean, that was huge. What? And, and another thing, too, that I appreciated with Bob, he would have had different people coming out to open for him, like Smokey Robinson, Betty Wright, to open the concerts. But then one year, Bob just decided he wanted I-3 to open mm -hmm. for him. And that was separate and apart from providing the backing. Yes, we opened and we provided backing. Mm -hmm. But I really commended him because he could have had other people, but he chose us to open for him, and he paid us separately. Wow. Separately from our <laughs> pay as I3, you know? And, and so even myself, I was introduced to a record company because um, Phonogram Records came out and, and saw the I3s, and so I got an opportunity to have a record deal with them. So that was what Bob gave to me and gave to us. Black Woman was on the Tough Gang or phone, the, the Black Woman album? It was on the Tough Gang, but it was licensed to Phonogram. Okay. So was Bob involved in production for you in any no, way? No, he was not because the, 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 the record was already produced. You know, so I was able to give them that because they mm -hmm. were impressed with Slave Queen, mm -hmm. the song Slave mm -hmm. Queen. Yeah. I know, I, I know all of that album, all right? <laughs> <laughs> so give me your, 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 your impression of perhaps the most memorable experience you have had mm -hmm. with Bob Marley. There is so many memorable experiences. But this one in particular that I talk about all the time in Zimbabwe. We went to Zimbabwe and I understood that Bob was the one who took care of all the equipment because, right Alan? Bob took care of the equipment because Zimbabwe did not have the money to even invite Bob and his musicians. They wanted Bob alone and Bob said no. I want to take my musician, I want to take my background vocals with me. And so he paid, went into his pocket, and took care of the equipment, the musicians pay our airfare, and give us, you know, a, a stipend. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that, 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 stood out, that stood out for you as far as, as, a, as a show, as a, an experience with him. Right. But, uh, um, Neville. You seem to have an experience of, of that, 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 that show in Zimbabwe too. Can you share it with us? 
Well, two emissaries came from President uh, Mugabe, our Prime Minister, to meet Bob at Hope Road and said he was officially inviting him and they came with two airplane tickets. And Bob said, no, man, me have to bring my whole band. In fact, when they came, they said, uh, pleased to meet you, comrade Bob Marley. And Bob said, no, man, I come red, gold, and green. I'm a comrade. <laughs> So anyway, him tell them it's okay, I'm deal with it. So I'm called Chris Blackwell and say, well, Chris, Zimbabwe having them independence, and you know, I make this song Zimbabwe and want to be there when my baby born, if Ireland can support it. Well, Chris never really see any promotional value from it. Well, and well, then well, Bob well, said, well, 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 Chris, well, well, I'll to cut it here, sir. I'll to cut it here, sir. <laughs> yeah. I'll to cut it here, sir. Never. Listen to this now. And I mentioned it to Bob, because Bob just tell me about the incident. How can you expect Chris Black to support a mission like that? Uh, uh, crazy. I mean, yeah, yeah, Chris, that, yeah, that, but I, I, I have to tell Bob that to me. Bob mentioned it to me. I remember, you know, all this show, this, this came about in Addis Ababa. As we said, the show thing in Addis Ababa. When he came there, he met uh, the brother from Zan and Zapu. I met him in Addis Ababa. And when Flippin gave me the song in Zimbabwe, and he, Pick it to the guitar and thing like that. And the brother made them say, Boy, this is a nice song. So that's where everything started. They, then they went through to the, the guys who were in charge at the party there. So that's where everything started. Mm -hmm. But um, in terms of asking Blackwell, a, a company like Ireland, to support a, 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 a thing like that, when I tell Bob, I say, You're crazy. I say, You're crazy when he mentioned it to me. I say, I say Brother, you're mad. You're crazy. And then I say, Bob, how could you expect? Island company to support that. That's 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 your that that's is, that, that's your position. No, that's not. I mean, I mean, if you understand the whole politics, so you, that, that that's out. How could you well, out of your? I mean, <laughs> I mean, just it was just unbelievable. So I said, look, but I said, brother, you're crazy around with you. You could never expect that <coughs> Island Record not going to give you no support for, 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 uh, for a mission like that. And that's absurd when he, when, he, when he was mentioning that to me. In Addis Ababa, I said, boy, what's your block with, man? No way. Right now, card, no, no way. So, so get that straight. So that's straight. All right. Get that so, 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 that's so, out. So, so Neville. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, our skill saying is true, but, you know, Bob was thinking from the point of tour support, like how the record company give us some tour support right, money. Right, right. That is so a anyway, different, different, different thing, man. Different type of politics, that man. Mm -hmm. I was so surprised at him. So you're crazy. I mean, how oh dare you? Politics. Let me serve the Queen, Zimbabwe. <laughs> right, you, man. Crazy. But no, I beg you a greater story upon that. Make a finish this. So, anyway, Bob looked upon Chris and said, How much money may I have? I don't know where Chris tell him. But Bob said, Me just pay for everything myself. I think it did cost about ninety thousand US dollars. We, we we get plane for you, you get a private yeah you, 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 you chartered a plane and thing to go down there. Yeah, plane with equipment because Bob said now nah, perform under no street light. He want perform <laughs> like oh he would have look at Madison Square Garden. All right. Hmm. So set up a big stage. I mean like Zimbabwe people them amazed. Them never seen nothing like that before. We set up stage and light and sound. I took some photos there too. But uh, so that to me was real commitment for her to say, you know what, my baby about me just pay for it myself. And I really took on that responsibility. And then they greet us like royalty when we come to Zimbabwe. Because I remember PJ Patterson came maybe on the same plane ahead of us. And after him leave, and we come off the plane, it's all, the whole government was there. Red cap is a great way, and the people them want broke down for company, the tarmac, they want to like hustle way out. So anyway, Prince, uh, I feel that was really appreciated, but a little story too, you have a guy named King Charles now, in England, right? <laughs> where, we land, where we land at Nairobi airport, and when we look at VIP lounge, two emissaries came and said, well, Prince Charles would like to meet Bob Marley. Bob looked upon them and said, yeah, man, bring the prince, come. Mm. 
Hey, <laughs> listen, me had so much respect for that brethren. You know, look upon them, because I'm no man with that. What the prince said? Bob said, bring the prince cup after all. <laughs> <laughs> if I king. <laughs> and he went to Zimbabwe to just pull up his mother flag and carry it home. <laughs> and later on, Prince Charles came to Bob Marley Museum with him wench and Donna Rasta wig. Bunga Herman can tell you, playing foot the drums with him. But I will say to you, Bur Bunga Herman, you can't let the oppressor play with war weapons. Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> that no, 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 uh, no. Uh, uh. <laughs> Because the drum is so well, hard, I, I remember, I remember. Prince Charles <laughs> played drums with you. No, no. Because he's a man, I don't care enough. Me just say what they put my mind. So I right. never did love. <laughs> never. Just the brother come with a rasta tam with some like a fake dreadlock. The same man who come on Bob for come meet him. So that memory is great for me because I said, Skipper, you're the best. Yes. I will leave Zimbabwe at that. All right. And I, 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 I have a man all the while, my good friend, who kind of embellish the story of Bob concert in Zimbabwe and say, oh, prisoners broke down the wall and come true. That is a lie. I have to embellish Bob. Where the stadium was, was like our Nannyville near stadium. It was in the ghetto. And when the ghetto people, them hear the music and the soldiers, them marching, them just marching behind them. So they decided to tear gas, tear gas them. them. But with so you power. were tear gas to, to, to Yeah, we, I was we, we on the But you take the tear gas and blew it into the royal box. <laughs> See? Take time with people. That's the mystic of John. Uh, 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 skills of a take time. <laughs> they will tell you them they need the stage <laughs> and Bob said to them no make me talk Judy Judy have an account here yeah <laughs> go choose this your Judy all right we were on the stage singing bellyful and all of a sudden there was a strange sensation um, a <laughs> smell and we didn't know what it was and it was getting worse. And when we look, we see children in the audience, they were fainting. So we said something serious are going. So um, we walked off the stage and then Carly walked off and everybody else walked off. Bob was still on stage in his element singing. He was still singing? Still the singing. The band had he, left. And, everybody and left and he alone was there. And then you can see Bob open his eyes and look around and there was no drummer, there was no keyboard player. And um, he finally came up. But before that, there was a brother named Joe Stabliski. Joe, you remember Joe Allen? And we asked for Joe and we found Joe and said, Joe, carry back to the house. Me no one come as Zimbabwe if get killed. <laughs> me have my picnic them in Jamaica. <laughs> I didn't know what it was. And then we saw um, Prince Charles battalion of soldiers. We didn't know what was going on. So we rushed, you want to see me, I roll up the red, gold and green skirt <laughs> and trying to get out of the stadium. Finally, we went back to where we were staying. And when we went back, we watched it on television and we saw the Union Jack pull down the Rhodesian flag and put up the Zimbabwean flag. Mm -hmm. And we said, no man, we can't come so far, travel so far. And we came to behold that. Mm -hmm. And we ran away from it. No joke, carry back. And so we drove back to the stadium. But when we got back to the stadium, Bob came off. They were just coming off stage. And Bob looked at us and said, now I know who is the true revolutionary. <laughs> <laughs> because we ran. So the ice Never you run to. Or the wheelers <laughs> and everybody run. Neville, hmm? you run to. No, no man, we, we to left run. the stadium. Eh? The Did you run? Where yeah, I'm going to run? I'm in the middle of the field lighting the show. Oh, you you lighting the show. All right. So, so you yes, so what I had to do is I didn't have any water. I had some soft drink and I poured it in a rag and cover my eyes through the tear gas. So, yeah, I got tear gas. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. Me okay. can't run away from the show. <laughs> okay, all right. <laughs> but Just what, checking. That night, <laughs> what I really admired with Bob, that whatever Bob Marley sang, he was willing to stand behind it. Committed to it. Committed to it. Mm -hmm. Because with all that was going on, and he never knew the depth of what was happening, yet he stood. Mm. He stood his ground and completed the purpose of which he came for, you know, finish the concert. And finish the concert. Yes. Um, wow. You don't speak about Bob Marley without speaking about Chris Blackwell nor uh, Don Taylor. I mean, those are important players in the, in the Bob Marley scheme of things. Uh, how, how critical you thought the, the, the relationship was between Marley first and, and Taylor, and how, how important you thought that, 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 that relationship with Taylor was to the advancement of, that of was, that, that was the beginning of a new era. Mm -hmm. um, great management. Great, great management? Yeah, yeah, yeah. International. Yeah, great management. And um, Dan was a guy who I have to respect him for what he did, what he, you know, when we went to start um, the Center for Mission, you know, Marley was a selling in America. He didn't sell in America. And we found out we, one of the reasons why was that was that State Department didn't want that type of music in America, all right? But um, Dan Taylor was very professional in terms of how he planned the show. You're talking about the, the, the venue that we went to. We went to places, we went to some 400 to 500 seaters. Uh -huh. Some universities, 700 seaters, 500 seaters uh -huh. at the beginning. Now the only people in those, in that period of time that gravitated to to, to, to Marley's were the college students, the university mm -hmm. students. Right. You know? And Dante did a survey and found out all those things. And then you now he started planning shows in certain areas and he didn't know where to go. Where to go, yes. And don't, over, don't try overbook. In other words, don't go to a place where you know you can't draw 4,000 people. And you're going, I mean, you can't. Well, you can't 5,000 um, venue. You go to a venue where you don't care and you have 2,000 people. Right. And, I mean, a venue that hold 5,000 people and, and you know, you're you capable of only 2,000 people. Yes. Because you would ask the promoters them, what's the capacity? How much people are you expecting there or whatever? And then you say, well, book me here or book me there. So he was very meticulous, very scientific. He understood the business. And in, in, he did the same thing in Europe too. So he was, to me, wasn't giving much credit, but that was a turning point, you know, because of how he... he um, Strategized, man. Yeah, you know, as Nadi said, he strategized the thing, mm -hmm. and I was there. I was overseeing everything, and he was, he was, he was, um, he was fantastic. He was good at what he was doing as a manager. When Dante and I go inside our office and talk, I've been there quite a few times, and when that man come out, they're proud. You share that, you share yeah. that view today? about Don Taylor, you, you, you had a lot of interaction with him and... Yes, I know. <laughs> <laughs> yes, but um, he was somebody that is direct and he would get what he wanted. Uh -huh. If he goes into a record company or wherever. That's what he wanted as a manager. Yes. Yeah, that's what he wanted as a manager, a man who talked mm -hmm. to him and what he want. Never? What he wanted, you know. Yes, your, sir. Your views on Don Taylor? I'd rather not have any views. He's not my friend. Okay. <laughs> yeah. But in terms of moving Marley, you can't leave out Don Taylor. Because black people didn't understand in the music mm -hmm. and how to, to market it. Don Taylor was the man. I can't tell you that. Because after, that is something. After certain things took place, then Blackwell started to take Bob very serious. When he lost Jimmy Cliff, and Jimmy Cliff walked away, then he started taking Marley more serious. Because what had happened is that having, having lost a top man in his day, he wanted a next artist. Replacement. And but but I say this because you get a lot of views. Alan, I mean, you're very positive about Don. 
But you get a lot of views similar to... No, look to, here. To Dante is an individual that everybody is going to like him. You know. he's, a, he's a brother where people don't like him. You know. He's a queer and you know, he's a man of the people who like people who love Bob Marley, so Bob Marley writes, you know, you see people. When I care about Marley, I want to shoot this and go to the places and go sell the record at Dubai. So people don't like him because I talk to people, you know. When I came to the radio station, you people said, you know, chat to nobody, you know. But he was just like that. You understand me? Now, Dan Taylor is a person like that. He's going to talk and he's going to tell you, tell you certain things. And if you don't Truth. like it, he just, mm -hmm. he just go here. But in terms of his business now, as a manager, I know business about the next part of the man's personality. As a manager, you can't get a better manager than a Dan Taylor. Mm -hmm. He do it to all of the artists that take out. Because that's the Greg Rice is all of them. He make everybody make money. And that's what, that's what a good manager is all about. Don't play with Dan Taylor. Dan Taylor was the man who was one of the top architects in carrying Bob through. God, I saw one man who said, I'm there, and I know more than even when I talk, they forget to call them. Me can't tell you that. Dan Taylor, don't get the credit you're supposed to get. Okay. Apart from taking the same shot from a man, mm -hmm. <laughs> that I used him. But what he did in the business terms for Bob, Bob Marley cannot be equal. That's big. The seven shots, right? Uh, that, that, oh yeah, yeah God, well, I mean, that, that's, that's quite impressive. Very big. Now, uh, now we talk about the, the, the Chris Blackwell and the importance of Blackwell. Uh, many people will contend that Blackwell was critical to the success of Mali. Uh, he is credited with understanding the market and positioning Mali in a way that he was able to cross over and make an impact. What uh, is don't, don't misunderstand me. No, no, no. Blackwell had his input. You know. No, no, no. I want to but just say, say what? Yeah, yes. He had his input. <laughs> but as I said, st the strategy of marketing Mali, especially in Europe and in America, where, 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 where you call the brainchild work of Dan Taylor. In other words, he would tell them where to go and the type of venue in special that that he wanted his artists to go. And he would do it in such a way that he would tell a, he tell a promoter, listen, I want to carry my artist come up place I'm worth fifteen thousand, I'm gonna go to nine and ten thousand dollars. You can't get my you can't get the date the date back next year. No. That's the type of guy. But in terms of no Blackwell, Blackwell he had he did what he in you know, the island had to do what they had to do. But it wasn't people like Dan Taylor, they wouldn't have done yeah, a label, a label has to work with the management. Yes, I, yes. I mean, because if you don't do that, then it's not going to work out. there are times that label don't work with management. If management <laughs> don't put him foot on Yeah, the, the management has to stand up for, for the artist. Yes. And because yeah. the label sometimes has a hundred different things to Good. do. And so the management has to Good. be the one responsible. Yes. yes. You, the manager, you know, have to understand the art, the art you have, or the artist that you have, the value of your artist. You have, if you know, if you know, if you don't know the value of your artist, you're going to have a problem in terms of how you're going to market. not sell him, but how you're going to market him. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm trying to say. So, mm -hmm. Dan Taylor was, as I said, that type of, but going back to Blackwell did what they do because they had to invest, they place a lot of money to make money. Mm -hmm. you know? And then the aftermath was where really, Marley really sell us after, after he died, he sold you know? Yes. So you have to understand what took place then. There was another, another, a next ball, ball <coughs> that took place where you now they had, you had to go and spend money because a lot of money were involved. Money were involved. And big money too. Musically speaking, Clyde McKenzie here with Judy Moth, Nadine Sutherland, Bonga Herman, uh, Alan Cole, and, and Neville Garrick. What, what, what an assembly. This is, this is really a classic. Musically speaking, talking with people who knew the legend Bob Marley. Alan Skill Cole is here. Nadine Sutherland is here. Judy Mott is here. Bongo Herman is here. And we have Neville Garrick. Uh, Neville took a vow of silence on the matter of Don Taylor. Um, and it's, it's, it's better that way. Bob, Bob always used to say, you know, if I have nothing good for seminars, say nothing. Right, I, so I think you learned that from Bob, the, the, the value of silence, Neville. <laughs> um, well, 
everything yeah. that Phil Cole say is true to a fact that he got a better deal with Bob with Island Records. He know to book venues and hotels, but he must taking things on the side. And he never liked me to me as a university educated man. And you can't run rings around me that way, the evening business. So if I in the room with Bob and him want to talk business, he would say, do we need never Gary here? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, easily embarrassed. I would get up and start walk and Bob say, Well, go sit down, Gary. Don't get too upset now, Gary. <laughs> Let's keep going, going. <laughs> God damn. <laughs> yeah, my well, still. <laughs> now come here, watch him the whole time. I mean, me reveal something. The first two years, me go up and tour with Bob. Me had a visitor's visa. And Dan Taylor take 30% tax out of my money. So he became the IRS. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so I said, if him robbing me at the bottom of the totem pole in terms of salary, what is he doing at the top? Then Dan Taylor got his lawyer and his accountant to be Bob's accountant and lawyer. That don't work. But Judy you used to get paid. You never have a problem. No. <laughs> you never get. You get. You got. You got. You got the wicked taxes that from <laughs> that, that, that that never experience. <laughs> no, but Judy was on work permit. Them had to pay tax. Oh, okay. But you. But 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 him rob you. <laughs> he got on a visa. Visa. So him take my tax money. <laughs> I know. I know. Copeland Forbes has quite a story in his book about Don Taylor. Some of it might not be as flattering as as Alan's account. Um, you know, that's 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 the most I would say about that. But hey, listen, uh, hmm? Dan is a very lucky man. Dan had delay, which produced why well, the name just slip out of me. One of the big producers of them after. He might Prince Publishing, Jazzy B, I, I mean Burning Spear. Everybody yeah, him know but him was a man taking fame thing from the side. I mean, never love that. See? Okay. So that I account. I not have much more for say. All right. Me get no detail, might get no trouble. All right. No, 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 no more <laughs> no more detail. Uh, just just the, the experience, Judy, of, of providing the backing with the other the other two sisters. What Can was, I say something yes, before? Yes, you, you want to say something before. No, I was just saying, um, I, say, I want to say to Alan, we, when we went on tour, the bulk of the audience would be white people. Mm -hmm. You know? And um, Rita and I and Marcia would say, why every night is so much white people? You know, and we haven't seen much black people come into the concerts. That is true. But guess what? We get to realize, I found out, when you go into the record stores, there was a strategy in place. They did not advertise Bob's CDs and so in the black section. It was in the white section. Mm -hmm. So white people came in, went into their section, purchased, purchased Bob Marley CD, Think, I don't know if they thought it was a white man, but although his picture was on it, but it was in their section, not our section. So when they purchase it, go home and enjoy the music, when it's time for a concert, they were the ones that flooded the concert. Yes, it, 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 it is a matter of history that it was the white market that was really the big purchaser of, of Bob Marley and that the urban market came later. So, yeah. so, so what I'm here's changing now, and we found out later, because State Department called in Chris Blackwell and put on the album and said, this can't work in America, we just gone to um, the Black Power movement and it got too much, too much um, problem. So this can't work in America right now. And Blackwell got to Bob and tell him, say, well, this is what the man them say, you know. So it just, it just concrete what I say, in America, the music was suppressed. We talk about now, what you talk about, the white community were more, <coughs> it, was, it was more 
promoting the white community more mm-hmm. than in the black community because they didn't want to do those type of messes. You know, black people, they start listening to Bob them baby, you know, mm-hmm. in America, you know. Mm-hmm. And Bobby said, when you go to Europe and Bobby said, come to me at night, I said, how much black, how much black people come to the audience? I want to swing and then they say, so how much black people can come to them? He said, well, I'm one hand. He mm-hmm. said, boy, the black people, they now wake up and go on. But this audience, I'm going to say, forget about that. Your audience is a white audience in Europe especially. Yeah, but it will come. But then, we, you know, as I said, time, and we found out all these things that took place in America. Wow. Yes, and so it was the music was suppressed. Not because the music, see that the music, the contents of the music. Mm. Because I remember, you know, some serious um, <laughs> lyrics, you know, <laughs> that make people afraid, you know. I mean, the status quo afraid of certain things. Bob and Bob and the two artists, I mean, it's going to write and people afraid, you know. Government institutions are afraid, you know. Mm-hmm. You understand me? So, as I always said from the early days, it's not your music when cause the trouble, it's your lyrics. Lyrical I used to tell him that all the while, and Planner was the man who used to talk. And Planner was the man who used to talk. I said, Boy, Alan, just making me some here, because we are talking about some rotted government, you know. <laughs> you don't play. <laughs> not the Planner used to tell me that from late 60s, so just making him some here, please. <laughs> This is an artist, you're not a hard, every artist, he may write some song and turn the place up, and it's true. Uh, he, was the, he was that type of individual. Yeah, yeah. But he was an ambition. Yeah. He was an ambition. Because I used to tell me all right, but I never talk, never teach the people, man. Boy, they might take too long. And he was talking about the black people. Yeah. How, 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 how did that a rehearsal um, go, Judy? I mean, how did, how did, how did your structure show? How was that done? Rehearsals, rehearsals, rehearsals. We would rehearse if we <clears throat> hours. I have a throat problem. We would rehearse for hours. If there is a concert in the next three months, we would be rehearsing before, like three months before. So when you finally landed on stage, it's like you're in your backyard. Comfortable. Yes, you're very comfortable, very confident, because Bob was a stickler for rehearsal. He was a disciplinarian when it comes to that. I remember um, Top of the Pops, he was doing, um, I don't remember which song, but he was invited to perform. The performance was in the night and we got there from maybe about 10 o'clock in the morning. Yes? Yes, and Bob have us rehearsing over and over and over. We went to lunch, come back, we know the song, but Bob just insisted that we have to rehearse. Um, he was like a regimented person, but he got the job done. Uh, uh, Neville, you, you were lighting director apart from being, well, art director. Um, what was that like? Well, <laughs> listen, the first two I go out with Bob, not his red tour. And I have to give credit to Herbie Miller, uh, Alan Skillcole, who I know from First Farm or before at KC, <laughs> and Let's Dermot Hussey, who kind of convinced Bob that he need a man like me because art director, what, what is that? You know, what are you going to do? So we're on the plane, fly to New York. And are you give the work skill? <laughs> Yeah, me give every guy the work, man. <laughs> yeah, me, me give him the work. Me go for him. Yeah, you go just for, you just coming from the university, I'm going to see him and say, never. Where you go to school? Because I'm never seen from any place. Where you go to school for? I said, never. Where you where, 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 where master? I'm telling him, he said, graphic art. I'm going to say, what? What is this? She said, the first album jacket every guy did. You know? She said, she had it. My Dem- one. Jody. Yeah, yes? yes. First Black. album Alan jacket. Made him do it. Black woman. No, Mellow Moon. Mellow Moon. Oh. Okay. So listen to this now. That was Alan's production. It oh, was, okay. it was, it was Tarot Demacada who did the first logo for Tough Gang. Tarot was the, the um, director, what do you call it? At, at Daily News. He was the. Um, it was the sub editor. Yeah. So when Tarot. Yeah, yeah Tarot. No, the yeah, great Tarot. Tarot yeah. So Tarot was the man who was around and thing like that. But, Time get away that come, come to crunch time and meet and tell and say, Well, you come full time. Tell starting, give me some time and tell say no, because tell never never understand the extent of all this business was going to evolve. Mm-hmm. So here comes KG, woke up KG, you know, KG from 60, 
from early, about 63, 64 minutes to KG from the KC. KG come back and tell me, say, well, graphic art and tell me, say, oh, what? So when I meet with Pamba, I say, boy, you want to find a man, you know? I'm a schoolmate, you know? I say, what? I asked every guy if I remember. So I carry in Garrick. And, and I bought my leg in the work, you know? And me alone call him in the work. And me, he can't tell you, say, anything me say. Him is what he can't tell you, anything me talk, say. Was like law. A lie, sir? No, sir, I'm oh, a lie. Please. But if I can't tell you. <laughs> <laughs> But me that I'm on the pan ego thing, you know. And you go around and tell me. But 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 you're a star from from your body. But I'm just showing you that when never girl can the man in my town, never must remember says, me give him the work, not Bob give him the work. (laughs) I give him the work. You give him the work. Yes. All right. So so he planted this so. Are you planting this so? Yeah man. (laughs) He planted. (laughs) Yeah, but Neville. So I mean, it wasn't just it wasn't just the graphics, but you were dealing with lighting. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. You make that transition. Well, I, I tell you something. Bob come sit down beside me on Natty Dread tour. First I got New York, and then come sit down beside me and said, "Never get where well, you really going to on this tour." <laughs> and I said, "Where the way the man so is like would I turn back the plane if me not answer right?" <laughs> <laughs> so I say. Well, I go in the lighting of uh, this Marcus Garvey backdrop, which I like put behind you because most of your audience is 75% white college students. Because why that happened is because the promoter for Bob Marley was really white college stations. They were really the hip stations at the time. And the FM stations, R&B, resist playing Bob Marley. That's how come the black community never really know about it. Okay. You understand? We couldn't get no R&B play. Plus, where the concerts, the white people would buy out the tickets in advance. So by the time black people know, you know, we usually buy a ticket the night at the show. Please. It it sold out. So anyway, my aunt said, man said, yeah, we have the backdrop. So that means them can just take the music for the rhythm. When them see Gavi behind them, who is like the John the Baptist of the Rastafarian movement, then we know we really are deal with. Right so this is what I was trying to bring man, to the whole musical experience was the visual experience of Rastafari. Right? I never have a big portrait of his majesty at that time. I had probably about a five by four and I hung that on the side. And we're really playing small clubs. No, I've never lighted a show before in my life. <laughs> and just as an artist, figure, well, this is just another tool. So I would just use the colors of the light, like I use a paintbrush. So Judy mentioned Paul's Mall, where we did like nine shows in four days in Boston. See? One show the first night, double bill every other night. Grover T. Washington was playing next door in the jazz workshop. Second night, him come over to Bob and say, boy, I'm glad you're here because the people who can't get in your first show, them come see my show, and then them come catch you the second show. So anyway, I would have like maybe eight flood lamps and some on and off switch. A very kind of primitive, but it was the best time to see Bob because you're only 20, 30 feet away from him in a small club. In my experience, you know, so you're really up close and you can feel it. So at them times, you really work hard. And then the lighting progressed till by 1980, I was using computers to preset my thing. So it was just me using light as an artist using a paintbrush. Because even some of the lighting companies said to me, why you use green? In fact, the rascal in color is 874. Rascal in green, primary green, because a dead color. I said, well, it might be dead to you, but it's rust, so it's red, gold, and green. So I tried to light Bob in the terms of mood. Whatever song I'm saying, I tried to illustrate it on my lighting board. If I'm the man at the bass line, because everybody had a special on everybody after a while. I'm probably six specials on Bob. When you see them shots of Bob with him here on fire and stuff like that. It's me doing that in terms of my backlight. So, 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 so you, you, while you were learning right. on the job, you were doing a fantastic yes. uh, <laughs> kind of experimentation mm-hmm. and it worked but, out. But I'm an artist. 
Creative. Yes, yeah. well, that, that is it. Creative. Creative. Yes, yeah, creativity, creativity knows no bounds. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes, yes. And I must tell you, you know, they did some fantastic... Yes, man. Fantastic. Everybody, 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 everybody can attest to that. Not even yeah. smiling. Yeah, man. Did yeah, some, man. some serious, serious, serious work, man. I tell you, man. No, man. It's classic, yeah, classic yeah, work, yeah, work, yeah. works of art. Yeah, man. Uh, yeah, man. We're wrapping up. The, we're wrapping up now. Um, we're going I to give... I just want to say one thing. Yes. Bob was like Christ in the sense that he chose the right people to be around him. To help to create this message and was trying to put to the world. Never Gary, the most important thing is the lyrics. The lyrics. So, right throwaway lyrics. So in other words, he selected the best team for the task that he had at hand. And I mean for you don't, sure. you don't want it, no, no, no that to that to me makes him one of the greatest managers, right, right, Nadine? Yeah, man. I mean, because he could he could identify the best people who for the task at the time, and yeah. that is that is great leadership. You don't you don't want mm -hmm. anything better than that. W w would you say that? Um, here, 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 Bob. No, here, oh, Bob, different. From the man was always the musical director, but Tyrone brought new energy into the band. So one time, Bob just say, you know. Now a fire family man as the musical director, cause I'm kind of too lazy. Tyrone is the musical director. So I make changes there because Tyrone, Bob never listen to other people's music. I drive him in the car and him say turn off the radio. Then him start sing a tune name, it's growing from the temptation. So I say, wait, it's a little secret temptation. Fun car, it's growing, it's not in the A side. And him laugh. <laughs> Then, so is a man where he never want new any outside thing, but Tyrone, to Tyrone listen to all kind of music from classic to jazz. He was the only one Bob kind of allowed to introduce some little nuances to the song. But everybody else have a play with Bob here in a theme head. Yeah. I'm very, 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 very disciplined with the music. And you can't make no mistake. What would you but say? Anyway, before I run out of the time, I pass it over. <laughs> So, what, what, what would you say? What would you say um, with regards to uh, what what Neville just said, um, Judy, in terms of the, the the musical experience? How 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 did that unfold as far as you are concerned? You know, there was Tyrone and you know all of these other people. How did that work out for you? Well, for me, Tyrone was like the musical the person that controls the music. Like for rehearsal and all of that, Tyrone, we were in a time where technology was growing. And so Tyrone would go out and buy the most expensive equipment, but it was for the time, techno right, technology, right. technologically. Te technologically. Yes, for the times. And, and so he was like a little ahead. Mm -hmm. Um, you know that, as, as Neville just said, that um, Family Man was the musical director. But um, when it's time for rehearsal, Family Man was always there. Family Man was the man who set up, go, set up the levels for us on stage. So when we go on stage, everything is correct. <coughs> and when he's done, then that's the time Family Man would come up and play. That is at a sound check, really, at a sound check. Well, let, let me just say something. When Baba was sang and <laughs> wanted to run it down, Family Man is the man. No other man then sent for Carly. But if I'm Family Man running around two, all one whole night and the next day, and then he said, Carly, Carly will come in. And then he put in Carly and Baba and Family Man and Carly. That's how it used to work. And what will happen to is after we finish a concert, irrespective of how far the venue was and we drive back to the hotel, we just change our clothes and Bob call everybody in the room. We're going to rehearse. After a show. After a show. Are you serious? And the songs that we were rehearsing most of the time is for the next album, the upcoming album. <laughs> <laughs> 
So, what, 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 I mean, Nadine, what, if, what kind of, in your brief association with him, what stands out in your mind? How respected he was as a musician, because I remember with Starvation, when he, he was over at the console, and we were in there, I never even knew he was there. And when he came in and he suggested something and he could hear the difference and the musicians, they listened. So he, I guess, they, they, knew, they knew the gong. I know so the gong was a man serious about the music. But I remember when the bass line said, try this now. Tum, 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 tum. And it made the song a little bit better. You know, just like some little things here and there. But one thing that comes out from Alan, that comes out from you, Nadine, that comes out from Judy, that comes out from Neville and, 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 and Bongo, is that he was very meticulous. Mm -hmm. he, he really was in the business of perfecting his craft, and that was foremost among, um, above everything else. You know, that is that name brand for the wheelers, in terms of Bob, Peter, and Bonnie. Mm -hmm. Because <clears throat> if you, if you, if you, if you had the, 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 the honor of being in the studio with them guys, and even a man like Peter Touch, when Peter Touch come into a studio, come into a session, Peter go on the keyboard. First thing Peter Touch is going to start going on the keyboard. We go to the studio, and we we'll am going to go to many sessions, and Peter come in first and tap on the keyboard and start work him thing and doing thing and Baba put in sing up him guitar early in and Baba come in and Bonnie come in and then fang up but Peter will be there first and do him thing and start him looking thing and then see stop on the so and look for him. and so Baba like Baba come in guitar ready now and just stand up and sing off him guitar and Bonnie now will come inside and sometime we go on the bass Take the bass and farms. This is what I want you to play today. Oh, that's Bonnie. Yeah, he, he's that type of guy. And they put on the drum piece. They were fan man, this is the team. Yeah, fan man, that one in the But um, it was a trademark for the Wheelers. They were perfect. And if, you, if, you, if you listen to Peter Touch, I see Peter Touch in our studio when finished and mixing. He made me so focused. And he, the least he could think. He's going to take note of it. Yeah, they were, that's a, that, that, that's one of the the great thing of, 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 of the whalers. Of the whalers. Yes, it is something that was just an experience. They, yeah, they probably learned that coming on there, <laughs> but they, they were professionals. Wanna thank Alan Cole. Wanna thank Nadine Sutherland. Wanna thank Judy Mott. Wanna thank Bonga Herman. Wanna thank Neville Garrick for this special on Bob Marley. This was really as good as you can get it. I mean, people who know the man and know him very, very well. Now, this is what you want. You know, because you go all over the world and you hear people telling stories about Bob Marley and Bob Marley this and Bob Marley that. But this is from the horse's mouth. Musically speaking, Clyde McKenzie here, thanking you for staying with us. Want to thank Danila Doyle. Want to thank uh, Kevin Williams. I uh, want to thank my nine-tenths, Maxine. And uh, you all, the great Scorpio is coming. Jack Scorpio, he will be here with you. Thank you once again for being on Musically Speaking.